Coming to you from wherever in the world I lost my lighter at, I'm RJ Balde, and this is the Tricombs Hash It Out podcast. On this show, we feature conversations about trending cannabis topics. We also bring in industry insiders and influencers to discuss their point of view. In this episode, I'll be talking to Danny Mersloat about his personal journey with transitioning off of prescription pharmaceuticals and opiates to much more effective medical cannabis. We'll also talk about ensuring accuracy and quality using heirloom and unique cultivars and more. Without further ado, it's time to hash it out. Today, I am joined by Danny Mersloat, medical cannabis patient and co-founder of the Lafayette, Colorado-based cannabis growing company, Alpin Stash. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, stoked to have you, Danny. How are you doing? Uh, how has your year been? Uh, I'm doing good. Um, very uh, last couple of weeks has been uh, a lot more work. It kind of comes in waves for us. We're getting ready for harvest. So uh, we enjoyed a calm period before that. And now it's back to the busy season, I suppose. Um, the year has been crazy. It's uh, definitely been uh, existentially crazy, but crazy in our industry. Um, when COVID uh, first happened and the lockdown happened, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty, uh, not only with you know how cannabis would be treated in Colorado during a lockdown, but the market as well, uh, the wholesale market for us, that is. Um, in Denver, they initially declared that uh, when the lockdown happened, they initially declared that cannabis, uh, at least recreational cannabis, uh, which is what we are, our license is, um, was not going to be considered uh necessary and therefore they were going to shut it down along with liquor stores mm -hmm. there was such an immediate backlash um that they came back on the air a couple hours later and said uh, our bad liquor stores <laughs> and retail cannabis uh would be considered um you know as uh essential businesses so we mm -hmm. stayed open and uh you know just chugging along man tell me about the that those few hours right before like so they announced that cannabis businesses have to close. And then a few hours later, they reversed that decision. What were those hours like for you? Um, well, they were, it was very, uh, it was very scary and uncertain uh, for us. So we're in Boulder County, which is outside of Denver. And this was an order for Denver. But mm -hmm. we knew that the rest of the state would follow suit. <clears throat> um, you know, so we were watching news program, uh, you know, the mayor make that announcement on the news and as they were kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, as they were kind of covering more of that story, they they cut to, you know, aerial photos of liquor stores and dispensaries with lines out the door yeah. around the block mm -hmm. because they said, you know, this order will take effect in, you know, whatever, 6 p.m. tonight. Um, my wife and I turned to each other and were like, oh, crap, because we had just harvested. And so, you know, we still had product to sell and we're small enough that, you know, every harvest matters a lot. Mm -hmm. And it was very nerve wracking and uh, very uncertain. And then all of a sudden, you know, they came back on and said, you know, essentially that the order was, uh, the idea was to prevent people from congregating, obviously, and such a backlash with lines out the doors around the block, everything was packed that they realized that that was a really dumb idea. And, you know, to think about, uh, everybody going through uh, quarantine and lockdown without any way to uh, relax or, you know, relieve stress, whether that's drinking or smoking or rather, you know, consuming um, is just crazy. I don't know whose idea that was. And, <laughs> uh, very relieved, very relieved when they came out and said that it's, you know, an essential business. And then there was, to be honest, there was like a, a bit of a wave of emotion too, because uh, you know, we we went just the arc of of cannabis in this industry has been so crazy. So to hear that we were considered an essential business um, was a little bit it was just a, like a crazy feeling because first off, you know, that gives us legitimacy and shows us how important people consider that this industry is. But second of all, second off, it's like weird to think that you could go in you know in a, in either north or east of here and or you know west to utah wyoming or kansas which borders colorado and and you know people still go to jail for forever for some of the stuff that we do legally here 
Yeah. And that's just such a juxtaposition. It was, you know, it was definitely on our minds and it was a weird feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have been feeling that feeling too. Like I, I obviously, I don't work in um, like with a cannabis business, like that directly uh, touches the cannabis plant. But I sort of felt that same thing too, when all the states in which cannabis is legal, uh, you know, deemed cannabis essential, which is like literally like the phrase of the year, like cannabis is essential. I've, if I had a dollar for how many times I've said that this year, yeah. um, but like it, it, it's this weird feeling, right? Because yeah, our, you know, cannabis businesses are deemed essential and yet they're still federally illegal. There's this weird sort of contrast there. Um, how do you balance that now in this year going forward with your business? Are there any weird uh, or or um, drastic adaptations that you've had to make this year at all? Um, n not really. Uh, we are small enough that we have, you know, between my wife and I, and then we have two full-time employees and one part-time employee. Our facility is big enough that we can you know, very easily maintain social distancing. And I mean, we pretty much did that anyways. <laughs> so, you know, it hasn't really been uh, in terms of like operating procedures and, you know, the day to day things, it hasn't been that different uh, mm. for us. Fortunately, you know, we've seen a very big increase in uh, the actual the market due to COVID. Uh, I think sales be from uh, May 2019 uh, to May 2020, or rather in May of 2020, as compared to May of 2019, I think flower sales went up 31, uh, percent which is which is crazy because you know the tourist market here in Colorado, it's a very big uh, tourist industry, is a very big deal, and that generally accounts for roughly 40 percent of sales. So you know that really took a dip, a uh, huge dip. So we initially thought that you know, that would suffer, uh, the, the cannabis market would suffer, but, uh, there was a huge uptick in it and it just makes sense. You know, people, I, I mean, whether or not you purchase cannabis for, you know, quote unquote recreational use, um, or, you know, the official term here is adult use, uh, as opposed to medical, you know, for most people, it, it, it is medicinal and that can be simply relieving stress. And so, um, you know, just collectively for everybody around the globe, it's been, you know, just, just crazy. Yeah. Oh, certainly. Yeah. This is definitely something that is unprecedented is another word that's definitely been played out this year, but that's honestly the only word that works for what's going on right now. Um, globally, like, like you said, on a collective, uh, level. So you started Alpen in 2014, 2015. I understand that you saw the healing benefits of cannabis after suffering from your own chronic pain shortly after you turned uh, 21 years old. I saw your episode recently. Uh, you were on a podcast hosted by Montel Williams, of all people. Shout out to Montel. Um, in which you, you said that doctors initially prescribed you Vicodin before even knowing what was causing your pain. So for those who may not have heard that story, can you tell me a little more about how you went from there to then being on a 19 prescription medication regimen. Yeah. So, uh, like you said, shortly after I turned 21, I, I actually experienced, uh, pretty severe stomach pains, was hospitalized for free for like four or five days. And, uh, the, you know, the testing that they did there, which, which is pretty minimal was, you know, inconclusive. Uh, so I was discharged with Vicodin to take care of the pain, uh, saw, uh, a slew of gastroenterologists and neurologists to try to figure out what was going on over the next, you know, year or so. Um, and then eventually wound up uh, at a physiatrist's office, which is a, a pain doctor. And the first appointment I saw with him, you know, he, he asked how my pain was. I said, you know, it wasn't being controlled that well. And he was like, well, we can try something a little stronger than Vicodin. Um, so he put me on fentanyl. Um Aye. Yeah, back then, I didn't know what that was. Uh, you know, this was like 2003, 2004-ish. Uh, um, nobody, you know, knew really what that was that I knew. And so I, you know, put my faith in that doctor. And, um, you know, things went pretty uh, drastically down here, downhill from there uh, over the next, 
you know, seven, eight, nine years, um, just sort of became uh, a lot of medication, uh, you know, a lot of significant amount of pain medication. I, I did the math one time. And I think I was taking around, uh, it's like over five milligrams of fentanyl in a 24 hour period, which is, uh, you know, double the lethal dose. Um, so, and then, you know, I started having side effects from that. So I got on uh, medication for side effects, uh, for those side effects. And then those medication caused side effects. And it was a really vicious cycle. Uh, during that time frame, I developed a, a nerve impingement. Uh, problem on, on my right side, on my neck that affected my arm, uh, lost 30% of my uh, nerve in my arm. And I, I believe that that was due to actually the opiates because I was sleeping like 16 hours a day and just such a heavy, deep sleep. I think, you know, I wasn't turning like I shouldn't. I think I just compressed uh, this area called the thoracic outlet in my neck. Um mm -hmm. So had, you know, three surgery, ended up having three surgeries for that. And then in this time period had a non-cancerous base of skull tumor, which had a pretty uh, major surgery to fix that. So uh, suffice it to say, after, you know, kind of in the middle of all of this, I just became very sedentary, you know, very antisocial, very uh, drugged uh, in, in such a haze, you know, Mm -hmm. antidepressants and anti-anxiety pills and you know uppers mm -hmm. because i was so drowsy from uh the opiates and downers because i was so amped up from the uppers and then you know it was just uh you know pretty terrible i was very very sedentary you know just going to doctors or spending time uh in in bed and in 2009 uh medicinal cannabis became much more accessible uh to those uh, in Colorado, I mean, you know, kind of everywhere, Obama sent a memo to the attorney general saying, you know, take a step back for states that were doing that. And that's when it really, the industry really took off. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, my father suggested I try that. I had had experiences with cannabis in high school um, and, and then a little bit after that. But uh, I feel like cannabis is the antithesis of opiates, whereas opiates you know, more or less zombify people, uh, you know, cannabis enriches life. And, and the two, for me, when I had done it, tried it, uh, you know, for fun, kind of hadn't meshed well uh, in those medicated years. So mm -hmm. uh, I was a little bit hesitant to try it, but I didn't really have any other options. So I, you know, in September, I got my card. I waited uh, until November um, to to go make my first purchase. And uh, found relief the first time that I, I, I used it and, you know, went from there. Uh, can you tell me the differences? Uh, just describe a little more of the differences that you felt immediately and long term in using opioids compared to medical cannabis. Yeah. So, you know, opiates, uh, they definitely give you a euphoric burst. And, you know, uh, it, it for some people, it doesn't really cover up the pain it just sort of makes you not care as much about it um mm -hmm. and then you know the more that you use it uh, you know it's the typical thing is is the more the more that you'll you'll need you go up and dose uh one thing that's really interesting and in retrospect is you know i've come to learn that for certain problems especially you know like chronic muscle or nerve problems of an unknown origin um the longer you use opiates, uh, the more your body will actually devote uh, neural pathways to pain. So the more pain you feel, the less the opiates work, the more opiates you get on. And then it's, you know, just a, such a negative feedback loop that uh, when I got off of the opiates, actually a lot of my pain uh, went, went back down to a manageable level. Just anyways, the other thing that opiates really do is you know, make you very, at least me, made me very, very stationary. Um, and I just had such a craving for terrible foods that I gained a bunch of weight. And that, you know, being stagnant uh, physically definitely adds to pain, especially when you're talking about, you know, over the course of years. And so uh, cannabis is sort of the opposite of all of that. It, it definitely, uh, you know, not only helped with the pain, but it helped my uh, my mental space, you know, just to be able to 
to find relief uh, physically allowed me to find relief mentally and, and realize that there was, you know, a space in which I could occupy in which my, you know, whole kind of being wasn't about being in, in pain and being, uh, you know, medicated. I, that there was a, a, a different space I, I could occupy. It, it helped me uh, enjoy the moment and the things that I was doing. I could really, you know, lose myself and, and whatever I was doing, whether that was hiking or, you know, binge watching anime, I could, you know, get, get that, <laughs> that, that physical and, and mental break, which is so important. I think people that are dealing with chronic medical issues, you know, after a certain point, it really becomes a lot of what you think about. And, uh, so even if you find physical relief, uh, that feels temporary compared to the, you know, mental and emotional stress that you're under. And, you know, whereas opiates really unplugged me from life, uh, and, you know, disasso- you know, uh, made me want to disassociate cannabis was the opposite. It plugged me, helped plug me back in and really helped, uh, you know, m- for me to, you know, just want to be present and want to be, want to be there. And then on, on top mm. of all of that, you know, how this, this segued into my growing as I, I got free with purchase. My first few purchases, I got clones and, uh, had always found gardening therapeutic. And once I found relief from cannabis, I really wanted to, you know, from ingesting it, I, I, I focused a lot of my energy and effort, uh, on growing and and that was the thing that got me out of bed. That was the thing that, you know, got me, you know, doing physically active things again, you know, lifting water and, you know, doing things like that. And so I, uh, that was really, uh, that was, growing was as therapeutic, if not more so than uh, ingesting cannabis itself for me. Man, that is, that is so deep. I love that analogy that you made. Um comparing uh uh saying that opiates unplug you and and cannabis plugs you in like that that's so deep and um I- important to note also because a lot of people not a lot of people but some people might think you know when you experience pain you you want to get away from it as much as possible you want to unplug from it you want to not feel it anymore but unplugging from it doesn't like you said it it more or less just masks it it um you're putting it in the back of your head, but more, you know, sooner or later, it's going to come back with a vengeance in like in your case. So while you're in this sort of um, haze of, of prescription opiates, how did you then find out that you were on like too many? So you start with one, they give you another one. They say you need this one for that one. You need this, these ones for these ones. And you, you end up with this you know, this huge web of just like pills for pills for these pills and for these pills. On top of all of that, you're in this sort of hazy, disassociated state. So did it ever feel to you personally that um, maybe the doctors that you were seeing weren't doing what was best for you? Uh, uh, in retrospect, absolutely. You know, the interesting thing about having gone through that is it really is like, uh, you know, like a frog in a boiling pot of water, uh, or, you know, water that they heat up. You, uh, I really didn't understand, you know, how messed up I was, how, you know, I had lost any judgment, uh, accurate judgment, you know, I mean, just, I, I, you, you, I couldn't see the forest for the trees when I was in it. And then, mm-hmm. you know, it, when I, when I, as I began to come out of it, um, I began to, you know, look back and be like, you know, holy crap, I had no idea what I was doing, you know, for years of my life. And the dangerous thing was, is during those times, uh, you know, some, some of what I remember, it was, I, I thought I was in control and I thought, you know, uh, you know, this is crazy. I'm taking all these drugs and like, you know, I'm still so in control and I know what I'm doing and, you know, driving around and, you know, holding down, you know, jobs here and there and, you know, doing all these things that I thought I I was unaffected. But in reality, I was, you know, so overwhelmingly uh, and completely, you know, affected by all these drugs that it's just, you know, is it's insane for me to think, 
that, you know, that doctors that I had put my trust in allowed that to happen. Um, and, you know, my, my history growing up, I had pretty bad asthma as a kid. So I had a lot of doctor experiences, you know, a lot of experiences being in the hospital. Um, and I had become very comfortable. And, you know, those doctors that treated me when I was a kid, I think that they were all really well intentioned doctors that really did have my best, uh, you know, my, my health first and foremost in their mind. And so I just mm. assumed that that's what, you know, medicine was. And, uh, I learned a very hard lesson that, you know, doctor, doctors are people. There are some that are, you know, great and they do it because they want to make people better. There are some that do it because they want to make money and they don't really care about what else. And then there's a wide spectrum in the middle. And, Mm -hmm. you know, just to assume that they're all doing it, um, you know, out of some, you know, altruistic feeling is, is really, uh, uh, a bad stance to take. Yeah, man, I'm uplifted and I'm, I'm glad, so glad to see you and to hear you on the other side of it. Um, and knowing that you, you, you made through to the other side of it, cause not everybody in your situation has that opportunity, man. So I'm, I'm grateful that you're here and you're able to, um, share your story now in a more, um, healthy mindset both mentally and physically man that that is awesome yeah thank you very much i I do i do definitely feel uh very blessed and and lucky because i i certainly think you know a lot of you know the support of my friends and family you know really uh made a huge difference and not everybody you know has has that in general yeah that support system yeah you mentioned that you're your dad was the one that suggested medical cannabis cannabis to you almost out of a desperation from what I understand. So what can you tell me exactly what he said to you that's that that really stuck with you and made you consider medical cannabis? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember, you know, the exact the exact words he said, but he he was a uh, he moved out to Boulder in, uh, I think, 1971 and was a drug defense attorney at that time. Um, oh. and, and helped start normal in Colorado. Um, and by, but by the time I was born, he had moved on to, uh, a different, uh, aspect of law. And, you know, really that was sort of something in the past. And I actually grew up with a, you know, Colorado normal poster in, um, in, in one of the rooms in my house. And I didn't even know what it was until in high school, some friends were like, you know, you know, that's like a pot leaf on that poster. <laughs> so I, I had no idea, but I know that he, uh, you know, was very comfortable in the idea that, you know, it doesn't do any harm. Um, you know, once, you know, your brain is more or less formed. Uh, my mom was, you know, pretty much in the same, uh, mind frame. So, uh, yeah, my dad was more or less like, you know, you should try this. There are people finding relief from it and it's not going to hurt you. So, you know, and, and I really, I really was at that time, like, you know, I didn't have, I mean, there was, there was just no, um, you know, no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, you know, things were not getting better. Things were still, you know, physically and emotionally, mentally, things were still, you know, on a, on a downward trajectory. And, uh, you know, on top of that, no, you know, no feeling of hope was, you know, very devastating. Um, it's just, it's a bad place to be in. And, and, you know, a lot of people are stuck in some, part of their life in which it's going downhill and they don't feel like there's anything they can do about it. And and really, you know, whether that's, uh, you know, a mental or physical or emotional, uh, reason or a combination of all those, you know, it really, uh, takes a toll and to have some form of hope, uh, is super important. I feel like. Yeah, no doubt. And, and to have, again, that, that strong, um, uh, foundation, whether it be, family or, or friends or just people around you to support you and to lift you up like that and to help you um, see through a haze that you might be uh, you might be in is is so important to, to have that that support behind you man um, uh, so you you mentioned that you had um, you had used cannabis before uh, in high school and even while you were prescribed uh, the opiates, uh, did, did you believe any of the negative stigmas about 
cannabis use uh, before you were a, a medical patient? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, you know, uh, it, it's interesting. I, though where I grew up uh, in Boulder, Colorado has, you know, is, is you know, is known for its, uh, it, you know, its cannabis culture and, and the, you know, hippies yeah. in the seventies. And although my parents were very supportive, I definitely was a product of the dare generation. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think, so while I enjoyed in high school, the, the few times I tried it after, you know, especially when I was medicated were, you know, negative experiences, you know, either, you know, a lot of times paranoia was a part of that. And that, that all traced back to these, you know, negative ideas that I had had of cannabis, you know, whether I, I you know, whether I thought it would be laced with something or, you know, I thought it would, you know, cause you know, damage or long-term consequences or, you know, which is so bizarre in retrospect because I was on, you know, so many medications that, you know, is documented, well documented that it'll do that. Um, I just, I really had uh, a layer of, of, you know, internalized stigma to work through. And uh, to be honest, a bit of a doubt, like, you know, oh, this is just, this medical use is just a, a segue into legalization and right. you know and it's i i didn't know if it how legitimate it would be um right. you know i i didn't know anybody that had used it for you know for for medical issues so mm -hmm. i didn't know how well it would work and that's why those all those reasons combined was why i had you know a three or four month uh lag between when i saw the doctor and was able to go to a dispensary to to when i actually did Oh, I see. So you you became a medical patient, but you didn't get your first like prescription of cannabis until a little after. Yeah, I got. I think I got my oh. card in mean, early September, and I I don't think I uh, went to the dispensary to purchase till around the holidays, and you know either I can't remember if it was mm. Thanksgiving or closer to Christmas. Um, I see. But I, I I sort of like put it off and put it off, and you know, and then eventually I was just like I don't. I, I need to do this. I need to try this. I don't have, you know, nothing else is helping. Yeah. And you were still taking the opiates while you were sort of deciding, were you? Yeah. I mean, I took the opiates uh, until, you know, while I was deciding, I took, uh, I was still on the medication, um, you know, mo almost everything I was still on, all those prescriptions uh, while I started using cannabis. But uh -huh. then shortly after, you know, as I began to find relief, um, and, you know, it was like, wow, this actually works. And the reassurance that I would be, you know, okay, um, you know, because I found physical relief, I, I could say, like, I can get off this because I know that if something becomes overwhelming, you know, that, that cannabis will be there and will help. And so I pretty quickly uh, started taking myself off all uh, all the prescriptions. I mean, I had wanted to not be on them for so long that when I, I was given the tools to do it, I just, you know, I was able to, you know, just very rapidly take myself off. So, you know, probably within about three months, I, you know, I'd gotten off everything. Wow. Three months off of everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, wow. some, some of them, um, you know, definitely were, uh, really easy to get off of, uh, you know, things like I was taking, um, I think I was taking Lyrica or, or Neurontin things for, for nerve pain, you know, those were easy to stop. Um, the opiates definitely took longer. And, um, I think that, you know, getting off of the antidepressants took a little bit longer too. Totally. Totally. So your doctors find out that the medical cannabis is working for you. Right. And from what I understand, once they found that out, they sort of gave you like, a, a weird sort of like ultimatum saying that you were either going to agree to go to their inpatient treatment center or they were going to just stop seeing you all together. Is that right? Yeah. So that actually happened before uh, I got on cannabis. And, oh, uh, this was even before you even yeah, had yeah. used it. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was a really interesting uh, experience because this had been a family uh, practice that had seen, you know, three generations of my family and I had oh, known okay. for many years and, and they were not the ones prescribing the pain medication or, you know, they were my primary care physicians. I was seeing specialists for a lot of this stuff and they, 
you know, told me they, they took me, you know, I had an appointment with them. They took me back and they said, you know, you need to, you know, leave here and go right to some sort of inpatient facility, um, you know, or we're not going to see you anymore. And from their point of view, which is understandable, you know, in retrospect that this was more of a, like a drug addiction problem um, than it was, uh, you know, a medical problem. And, you know, while there was definitely, you know, dependency that factored in into, you know, I mean, at that point I was, you know, definitely dependent on, on these medications. It was very much medical for me. Um, but they, so they gave me that ultimatum. I, I left that appointment being like, well, screw you guys. Um, you know, if you don't believe me, I just, it just so happened that I had later that day, uh, an appointment with, uh, to get my can medical cannabis card anyways. So, um, I left that practice. I went later that day to get my medical card and then, um, you know, went from there. And then, you know, the kind of full circle thing is, is I eventually, uh, you know, years later after I was, you know, kind of out of everything, you know, lost a bunch of weight and was, was healthy again. I, I went back to that practice and the doctor that sat me down and, and had that whole conversation with me, um, you know, passed me in the hallway and, you know, did a, such a double take that it was, a, you know, I guess, uh, sort of a highlight memory was, <laughs> you know, how, I mean, it looked like he saw a ghost yeah. and, and from there, you know, uh, they really, uh, listened that, that those doctors really listened and, and embraced my healing, uh, you know, experiences with cannabis. And so when I would go see them, you know, they would always ask, you know, Hey, I have a patient that's doing this. Do you think that maybe I should recommend they find a cannabis doctor or, Hey, what's your, what was your experience with this? Wow. So, uh, you know, it ended up being, you know, I guess a positive experience. Sure. Yeah. That's a good way to look at it. How how's it so how does it feel for you then, man, to be like giving the doctors medical advice on cannabis? How does does that feel weird to you? Um it it didn't really feel weird. It felt uh I guess cathartic more or less. I mean I had been I you know, I had I had wanted to pursue a, a career in medicine at different points in my life, some some sort of career. I had worked in, you know, labs. I had was it a certified EMT? And although I didn't work as an EMT, I used that certification and, you know, uh, you know, many times over. So, uh, you know, to, to give that, you know, just my two cents, um, you know, to, to, to people, uh, you know, knowing that they were asking me these questions because they had people, they had patients that were, you know, in a similar position to mine or, you know, some of them worse off, you know, whether that was with, you know, cancer or something like that, just, you know, to have, to be able to just, you know, share my experiences, um, was, was very cathartic, you know, and, and these, this practice, uh, medical practice in particular, I still go see them. My, my wife sees them. I mean, the, you know, these, these are doctors that care. And so to know that this advice I was giving them was, you know, hopefully going to help somebody else was, was a good feeling. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's, Good to hear that you have um, been able to maintain that relationship with the with the doctors and um, open up that dialogue that they were initially sort of, uh, I guess, trepidatious to even venture into. Um, that's awesome that you have sort of, in your own personal journey, served as a, a catalyst for getting this advocacy and this education out on the um, the efficacy of, of medical cannabis. Um, you you are a living example of uh, the proof that it works, man, and that is so dope. That is so rad. Thank you um, so much for that. Yeah, I mean, you know, is is I people have asked me like, was it hard um, to talk to you know your doctors or friends or family about you know cannabis after you after it had you know you know healed you? And my answer was no because the the before and after was so dramatic that I have experienced zero pushback um, from anybody because it's, you know, it's, you know, I wasn't, you know, actively dying, but I was definitely, you know, I mean, you know, more or less dying. And, and to have that be such a, such a contrast between, you know, so unhealthy, so sick, you know, not just physically, but, you know, uh, spiritually and mentally and emotionally to just like, you know, completely, uh, 
you know, back on track and, and, you know, better was, it was just such a, such a night and day difference that I have, you know, I, I don't think anybody can tell me that, that what I did was wrong or that I should have, uh, you know, kept up with the opiates and stuff like that. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm, the proof is literally, I'm, I'm speaking to, <laughs> you know, the fact that you can have this conversation with me right now is a testament to, um, your success, man, and, and finding relief. Uh, and that is, yeah, that's so inspiring and awesome to hear. Thank um, you. So, yeah, no worries, of course. Now, let's jump to Alpin Stash for a minute here. Can you tell me about how your uh, your personal experience with making sure that you know what you're getting and what's in your cannabis products, how does that play a role then in your company and how you operate? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, you know, so important. And I know for me was one of the things that, you know, I talked about uh, some experiences that I had in which uh, I had paranoia. And I know part of that for me was because, you know, I wasn't sure what was in cannabis. And granted, you know, after legalization happened, I mean, you know, that the things that I mostly I was worried about, you know, uh, it being cut with anything, um, you know, that first of all, that that wasn't a realistic uh, worry to have, you know, in general, that was a something that dare really you know, uh, scared me about, but, you know, something that, you know, almost nobody hears about, but just it sort of spawned from that idea that, you know, knowing what's, what goes in to your cannabis, uh, is super important. You know, it, what you put in your body becomes you and, uh, you know, in, in a very, uh, oftentimes like literal sense. And so to provide a product that is, you know, clean and comes with really good, uh, intentions and, um, you know, grown by people that care, uh, I think is really important. Definitely. Yeah, man. They got me too. Dare got me too. So don't you worry. We, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're in like the same generation. So yeah, I came up this like very similarly to you, man, that I totally drank that Kool-Aid. Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's crazy. It was, uh, the war on drugs was effective, uh, uh, you know, and, and now we're, you know, pushing back, which is, uh, awesome as well. Yeah, totally. Totally. So does that um, uh, uh, mission uh, of making sure that, um, you know, you know what's in your cannabis product, does that, did that directly influence your decision to use, um, you know, like uh, organic uh, methodology and, and heirloom varieties and all of that that you do at Alpenstash? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, you know, knowing, not only knowing, uh, you know, what goes in uh, to your, your cannabis, but, but who grows it and why is, you know, sort of the central, uh, one of the central missions uh, of our company. And, mm -hmm. you know, the other thing is, is that, you know, I grew up, or, or rather, like one of my interests growing up was whatever I was doing, I wanted to do it really, really well. Um, you know, I, I have ADHD. And so, uh, if it doesn't catch my focus, I, it's very hard for me to do it, but if it does, I just want to do it as best as I can. And so, it, you know, our, uh, the way we grow sort of started from there. Um, and it was also a realization that, you know, I would, we would never be, you know, a billion dollar company and, you know, we would never be able to, you know, feasibly go, go after the middle and bottom, uh, ends of, of the market in terms of quality. But the one place that we could we could shine in the niche we could occupy and carve out would be really high quality craft. Um, you know, it's, it's what we wanted to do anyways. It's what we love to do anyways, but really as a small business, that's the only way that we can survive. And so for us very much doing that is, you know, natural and sustainable, uh, you know, nutrients grown with living soil. Um, and you're really, uh, you know, everything we do is by hand. Our, one of the things that we like to say is, you know, elbow grease is our secret ingredient. And, <laughs> you know, and, you know, even as we scale up, that will always be the case because for us, uh, this is, you know, it's for everybody that uh, grows in our company, um, you know, this is a personal passion. I mean, you know, we, we do it outside of work, you know, with, I mean, this is just, it's just, it's like what, we like to do, um, and what we seek to do. And, uh, you know, it's very important for us as a company that, you know, and me as somebody 
that spent so much time, you know, not do, doing things that were I hated or, you know, just not yeah. wanting to occupy life that, you know, to do something that brought uh, joy. And, um, you know, there's a, a, a saying that I like from from a guy named Joseph Campbell. Uh, and he says, follow your bliss. And that's, you know, it was important that we do that. And, you know, growing in, in the way that we do is, is part of that for us. I love that, man. Yeah, I had a I had um, an old uh, acting coach when I was in college uh, who had something similar to that. Every morning he would look us he would look each of us in our eyes in the morning at like seven in the morning. So I'm already I'm still like crusty eyed, like half awake. But he would take a turn looking at all of us in the eyes and say, commit to your comfort. Like, don't spend too much time doing something that you feel like you have to do if it's causing you, you know, an incredible amount of discomfort to the point where it's debilitating your life or your happiness. Um, so I love that. I love that that advice to follow your bliss, man. That is, that's super cool. And yeah, that's that's definitely something that I, you know, I try to remind myself every day, but, you know, some days are easier than others. <laughs> yeah, you know, for, for a lot of people, that doesn't have to be necessarily professional, you know, it can be, yeah. what it, you know, as long as you have that thing that makes you happy. I'm fortunate enough that that thing, you know, I was able to transition that into uh, a profession. And, uh, you know, there's this journey of, of Alpenstash has been, you know, fraught with uh, moments of failure and, and extreme stress and all that stuff. But, you know, is uh, as rewarding in the end as, you know, anything, you know, like this can be. Mm, totally, man. And I think that's that's uh, a really great aspect of the cannabis industry that sets it apart from others is that it, it really is an industry where those who are in it and love to be in it, they're really in it because they love it. It's it's something that, like you said, you do or or that that carries with you outside of the workplace. Right. It's a it's a culture. It's a it's a community. It's a whole thing. And that really sets the cannabis up industry apart and sets those apart in the cannabis industry who uh, uh, it differentiates between those who really love it and are in it because they love it and those who are in it because they see it as a burgeoning market and a, and a, uh, uh, an opportunity to turn a profit. Like I feel like in the cannabis industry, sooner or later, you will find, you know, who is who. Um, they'll eventually it will be revealed. I don't know if you feel similar lead uh, to me when it comes uh, to that. Absolutely. Although sometimes it takes uh, some digging um, if that, you know, if, and, and, you know, I, I tell people all the time you vote with your dollars. So it's definitely worth it to find the, those of us who are in the industry, you know, for the right reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for us, I, I will tell you absolutely for us at, at the size that we are, uh, this is absolutely uh, a labor of love. You know, it, it, it is, you know, still uh, pay our bills, you know, harvest to harvest uh, type of, of, of business. You know, we are not by any means, you know, this is not, uh, we didn't start doing this, you know, to become millionaires. And, and while, you know, it's still possible that that can happen or, you know, that's still, something that that does happen uh for the little guys it is uh definitely a, la a labor of love i love that i love that now i want to talk about this because i was um looking over uh, and and watching different interviews um and reading different uh interview articles uh, uh featuring yourself i understand that apart from yourself alpenstash is uh purposefully composed majorly of women. So can you tell me about why that female foundation in your company was important to you? Yeah. Um, you know, it, especially with having my, my wife, uh, you know, co-own and co-run it with me. Um, she is very much, uh, an empowered female, you know, it was really important for us to find as much representation as we could, um, with that, you know, traditionally the cannabis industry has been, um, male dominated. I mean, many industries have, but you know, the, the sex sells, you know, toxic masculinity, uh, aspect, uh, has been very dominant in, in the cannabis industry, especially 
on the cultivation side. I mean, if you spent any time uh, in a grow store looking at ads, you know, you know, certainly before, uh, you know, adult use was legal, but just in general, I mean, it's so, so many products are, you know, uh, hypersexualized uh, women, you know, trying to sell nutrients or, or rather modeling for nutrient companies. And um, that has translated to some extent to, you know, the, the folks that occupy that space. I mean, the amount of times that we've been somewhere and somebody, you know, ask a question, uh, looks directly at me and asks a question as opposed to my wife, um, you know, or maybe my wife answers a question and then they still look at me with a conversation. You know, it's just, it's so blaring that that, that, that negative, uh, you know, image and that negative mindset exists that for us to try to, you know, push back, um, was important in, you know, being able to find, uh, you know, uh, strong females was uh, to work for us with, has been work for and with us has been uh, a blessing. And, you know, I will say this, uh, you know, as a man that women generally have a very caring and very nurturing uh, sort of aura about them and, you know, make uh, excellent, uh, you know, have excellent interactions with plants. And that's also, you know, a benefit. Yeah, man. Preach it. I love that. And that's so awesome that you have, um, you know, you've, you've sort of matched your actions with your voice in that you have, you know, implemented this strong female foundation in your company, um, which is, you know, a, a, a testament to everything that you've said, you know, you've, you've put your words into actions and, and that is super cool, man. Thank you. You know, I, I want to, I just want to say, you know, we, when we started up and stash, we didn't start out with, you know, mindset of like, you know, let's, you know, make this a strong, you know, a, a, a female empowered uh, hmm. company, you know, we didn't have anything against, you know, it wasn't like we were thinking the opposite. It just wasn't, right. didn't even factor in, but the, the people, especially when my wife started working for us, the people that just sort of, uh, you know, came together around the company tended to be, you know, strong females. And then, you know, we uh, very quickly embraced that, especially when, when my wife started working for us. But, you know, then just personally, I've always had an issue with the hypersexual sexualization of the industry, you know, of, 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 of events and of big companies, you know, traditional, uh, you know, I guess you would call them legacy companies if you wanted to use a, a fancy term, um, just in this space has just always been so frustrating because it, you know, it all fed into this idea that, that I, that I had when I first started growing, which was, you know, growers and people in this industry were, you know, other than or bigger than myself, you know, whether that was uh, a famous grower that was, you know, too cool to be approachable and would look mm -hmm. down uh, on anybody that asked questions or, you know, a company that just, you know, had, you know, booth babes at an event. It was just so mm -hmm. off-putting that when, you know, and then when I saw you know, that extend, you know, facets of that mindset extend to my wife's treatment. It was just, you know, it's so off-putting and, you know, we're very, we, we do our own thing in this, this industry and in this space, you know, we, we kind of just puts our, put our heads down and, you know, do uh, our own thing, whether that's, you know, our growing practices or being transparent and putting up grow videos or, you know, the genetics that we create and work with, you know, we've just, we do what makes us feel right at the end of the day. And, uh, it's, it's, uh, so excellent when those, those values sort of translate to other facets of life and, and, and seeing my wife, um, you know, push back against that, uh, entrenched, uh, grower mindset, uh, and, you know, toxic masculine aspects of the industry is just, it's, it's, uh, excellent to see her do that. And it's, you know, inspiring as well. Mm, I love that, man. That is such a cool story. And I'm, yeah, I'm totally with you on everything. Like I've been to my fair share of cannabis conventions, you know, back when, you know, re you remember when in-person events used to be a thing. Uh, yeah, in the, in the long, long ago. <laughs> yeah. You remember like 2019 BC, which I, I've been using for before Corona. Yep. Um, yep. I actually yeah, yeah. thought of that the other day and use that too. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I've been to my fair share of conventions back in the day, man. And I would have the same exact thoughts as you. So that is, that's awesome that, um, uh, to hear that we are kind of surfing the same brainwave there, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just get it, just seeing the industry 
pander to the lowest common denominator is just it's so frustrating because yeah. you know yeah. uh you should be allowed to have your own identity and maybe even you could say like subculture within cannabis that it shouldn't be alienating to anybody you know because it's such a healing plant and really at the end of the day is is all about connections and plugging back in um you know mm. it, it should be approachable and i didn't see people like me that were nerds and you know shy mm. and things like that well represented and you know it it, it just it 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 you know was sad that you know i'd go to events i'd go to the cannabis cup and everybody uh, it felt like, you know, was just about a different aspect and not to say that that's wrong by any means, but there definitely was a feeling that if that's not what your experience or your, um, you know, what you wanted to, to dress like or act like uh, was, if that's not where you were wanting to go, there was not really um, like a group for you. I never, I didn't see like, you know, video game and anime nerds, uh, like a booth of those people at any of these events or yeah you know things like that so no doubt man yeah, yeah. shout out to the nerds man we got to watch yeah, out for absolutely out here. to that end sorry it's, but to that end you know that's why it's been important for for us you know to be out there and be talking about what we do you know whether that's on youtube with our with our grow videos or uh you know our how to's or our you know our social media to just be accessible and be available and be welcoming and you know People reach out to us all the time and ask questions, you know, about growing and, you know, it's, it's important for us to, you know, be transparent and, and to help people with their journey and to not be judgmental of, you know, why they're in this or if they deserve to be. Totally. Now, speaking of that, where can our listeners find those videos um, of, from Alpin Stash? Where can our listeners keep up with what you're doing at Alpin Stash and keep up with you personally? Oh, and also what's next? What's next with Alpenstash? Yeah, so um, what's next for Alpenstash is we uh, are in the midst of an expansion. Um, we, our facility, when it's all said and done, will be uh, three times the size it is now, although uh, that has been, uh, the time frame of that has been significantly slowed down uh, because of COVID. Construction is really frustrating anyways, but mm -hmm. so that's sort of... Uh, you know, that's the big what's next for us. And really, you know, we just keep growing little by little, um, you know, every day and improving little by little, you know, every harvest. And so expect to see a lot more unique uh, and really awesome genetics from us. Um, expect to see a lot that happening a lot more often as we grow in size, we will be able uh, to sprout a lot of the seeds that we've made over the years uh, much more rapidly uh, and offer you know, even more uh, diverse cultivars, uh, you know, and and fun uh, genetics. And then um, in terms of where to find us, we're very active on our uh, on our, our social media. And shout out to my wife, Murr, for being such a badass uh, yeah. social media wizard or witch, I guess. And um, so you can find us uh, Instagram at Alpenstash. That's A-L-P-I-N-S-T-A-S-H. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. We haven't really updated that in a while, but we've got a lot in the works. Um, you know, there we have uh, little breakdowns on our, our some of our more popular uh, cultivars. And then we just have how-to videos. Again, you know, uh, empowering people to grow themselves, not only for the fun uh, aspects of it and for the healing aspects of it, but also just to show people, you know, uh, and encourage people to try it at home so they can see, you know, when you do this on a craft level um it takes a lot of work and a lot of knowledge and you know yeah. and i feel like if you can grow your own uh it's so rewarding in and of itself um but it also you know helps you give an appreciation to those that are doing it uh the right way um so you can find us on youtube our channel is alpenstash we've got a website alpenstash.com uh facebook as well and i would say though that for the most up to date information instagram's uh the best resource Totally. Yeah. I'm looking at uh, your Instagram right now, man. And yeah, it, growing from home is a hell of a lot of work. But if you have the patience and you have the love uh, and you have the information that Alpenstash can provide to you, you can grow some pretty dope flower like this orange crush that I'm looking at right now. This looks 
this looks clean, man. This looks Thank real you. nice. Yeah, yeah, we're really excited uh, for that one. Um, and and yeah, absolutely. You know, growing can be fun. Uh, well, growing should be fun. It it can be as easy or as hard as you want to make it. Um, and you know, uh, finding people that can help guide you in the right way, especially with with the idea that like. You know, you just want to have a successful grow. Um, you're not trying to produce, blow up a, ba- a basement and, you know, you know, spend, uh, you know, $30,000 in grow equipment and produce pounds. Like, you know, you can have an a amazing experience. You can come up with some product that's generally as clean or cleaner uh, and as good or better than what you can find in many dispensaries. Uh, you can do that at home and it can be uh, rewarding and, you know, fun. And I encourage everybody to do that. And, and you know, to that end, if, if any of your listeners have any questions, you know, we're available. Uh, we love interacting. We love helping people. We love pointing them in the right direction. And we love empowering folks. So, you know, reach out to us. I love that, man. I love that. My final question for you, my friend, which thank you so much for for being so generous with your time today. I really appreciate it. Um, my last question for you, my friend, is what is your favorite anime? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Um, I'm a big <laughs> fan of One Piece. Um, you know, I definitely, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, rewatching Dr. Stone, uh, Demon Slayer is amazing. Um, I, I like the variety that's available now. You know, Dragon Ball is a classic. Uh, yeah. it's, hard, it's hard to pick a favorite, to be honest. For sure, for sure. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> I dig that, man. Well, Danny, thank you so much again, man, for taking the time out to sit down and have this conversation with me. I'm, you know, I'm inspired, man, hearing your story, honestly. Like, you you have such an amazing journey, and, and what you're doing is so fantastic, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was an excellent conversation. I really appreciate it. My thanks again to Danny Mersloat for joining me. If you are a member of the cannabis community and have a story you want to share with us, we would love to hear from you. You can reach the show at hash it out at trichomes.com. You can help others find the show by taking a moment to subscribe to the podcast and write a review. You can also join the discussion with industry insiders and get your voice heard by joining the community at trichomes.com and following us on all social media. Hash it out is produced by David Fortin and presented by trichomes.com. I'm RJ Balde. Thanks for listening. <laughs>